Uh, Mr. Marchioni, I'm Dale Molnar from CBC News in Windsor. Just want to know, uh, we're all wondering if you have another product planned for the Windsor assembly plant, and if so, if that's going to be a crossover vehicle. If there is going to want to, if there is going to be one, it is going to be a crossover. Can you tell us if there is? <laughs> I don't know yet. Nothing. We're working our way through the economics of that case right now. So the car is designed. We know what it looks like. We're just trying to find out whether we can sell enough. But obviously, it shares the architecture with a minivan. So. We'll, we'll let you know as soon as we, as soon as we find out. We're still busy trying to launch a minivan. Eh? Let's not worry about the second car. Jerry Anderson, WTOL in Toledo. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well. And yourself? I'm quite well, thank you, sir. Are there any circumstances under which the next generation Wrangler will be built in Toledo? Could, you mean? Are there any circumstances, there circumstances would, under which this vehicle, the next generation Wrangler, will be. be will be built in Toledo? Could be built in Toledo. Um, the short answer to your question is that if the economic differences that were that were facing between the alternative production location in Toledo were to go away, then I think we would find no reason not to continue to produce the Wrangler in Toledo. But there are significant differences in the capital costs required by a Toledo allocation of the car, which is really the, the fundamental reason. I made the comment earlier <coughs> with the press. There was somebody from Toledo who asked me um, how I viewed this issue. I, I think it's – well, last year we sold – a million seventeen thousand and nineteen jeeps. Over half of them were produced by the workforce in Toledo. And they have consistently um, overperformed. I mean, there's not been a single instance where we have made demands for additional production at the Toledo that went unmet. So they've twisted into a pretzel, working hol holidays, working shutdown periods to try and get us there. I, and I think this organization owes them a lot. I think we I, – I understand this issue. That's why even if in the, in, in the event that the, the Wrangler were not to go to Toledo, we would – find alternative products for them to produce. So it's not an issue that will impact headcount or the future livelihood of our people. Um, but, but the Wrangler issue is a very painful issue because the amount of money involved here, the differences are large. And it, it doesn't matter what I do, I, it's almost impossible. For, I know it's impossible for me alone to make it go away. Um, and they're large. They cannot be ignored. So we'd have to find a solution that somehow um, alleviates the cost burden of that plant in some fashion going forward. And I, I don't, and it certainly cannot, and I can tell you that now, it cannot come out of the wage structure of our people in Toledo. So I would never ask for a concession from them on this issue, ever. And I think it's unfair. Um, so it has to come from other parts of, of the infrastructure, whether it's the city or the state, that we would have to find ways in which we could uh, make up that difference. It may take a long time to make up that difference, but we would have to find, we would have to have the confirmation of the fact that for a prolonged period of time the cost structure of Toledo, Toledo will be substantially lower than it is anywhere else. So since it can't come out of labor and it can't come out of the car because the car is what it is, that it has to come from the surroundings, whatever that may be, whether it's the city or the state. But we'd have to find concessions. We'd have to find a package of economic incentives that will make the issue go away. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw the ball into somebody else's yard here and saying, look, it's your problem. You need to come up with, it, with the answer. I, I've been as open 
um, as I can possibly be with both the mayor and the governor on this issue. And I'm going to meet him again, hopefully, in the next 30 days. But, um, and I'll, I'll make the point known to them. But I, I think it is important that we recognize that there is a limit to the amount of economic inefficiency that S, the FCA or Fiat Grasler can endure in connection with this investment. It's not a reflection on Toledo. It's just that it's, it's a consequence of a set of choices that were made a long time ago in connection with the production of the current Wrangler. Right? I mean, they, it's, it's, there's a supplier park that operates around the plant. Um, there were technical choices that were made in connection with that architecture the way in which the car is assembled, painted. Um, and, and so we're wearing the, 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 the results of those choices. To make those choices irrelevant going forward, it's going to require money. Um, and so we're really at the end of an economic discussion. I mean, we need to make that problem go away. If we can't, I think we, know, we need to look, look at a world outside of Wrangler, whatever that is. But I, having said this, I have every intention of turning myself into a pretzel to try and make the problem go away. But my, as I get older, I get less capable of turning myself into a pretzel. I suffer the pain a lot more than I would have when I was 30. Morning, Mr. Marchioti. Uh -huh. uh, Pete Langell from CKLW Windsor. More on the minivan plant, sorry. Yeah. Um, so we understand that you're about to embark on the transition of the plant, and the current generation will be still manufactured after that's completed for some time. Mm -hmm. How long? Where's Reed? If it was Reed, we manufactured until 2,250. Um, there are technical reasons why that car cannot be sold for a, a much longer period of time than the current time. It just there are regs regulations that are coming into effect in 2017 they are going to restrict or are either going to require a substantial amount of investment into the old architecture to make the problem go away or um, or they're just not saleable and so that plus the combination of um, of the some of the inherent inefficiency of the architecture and the powertrain will make the car just not Square, square the number. So, we'll try and keep it alive as long as we can. Do you have a final design for the next generation? Oh, it's done. Yes, we're tuning up now. I mean, it's just the horse left the barn. I mean, the car is. There are there are bodies that are meandering around Auburn Hills out of the pilot plant. I mean, it's just the when carcasses are it? visible. So, when will we see it? You'll see it at the show in January 16. Philippe Leblanc from uh, Radio Canada, right here. Uh, still about Windsor. Um, it doesn't seem very reassuring to the people of Windsor. Um, how important is this plant going forward for FCA? Two billion dollars worth of, of relevance. I don't know whether maybe it's inconsequential money to you, but. We have put in two billion dollars between engineering and development and plant infrastructure to build this van. I think it's the single largest Canadian investment that has been made in the auto sector in the last ten years. Is it reassuring now? Lisa Guyton from 13 ABC in Toledo. How are you, Mr. Marchioni? Well. Obviously, you said a lot has to happen before a final decision is made on the production of the next generation Wrangler. Do you have any kind of a timetable yet? Obviously, time does come into play. You also spoke about the workforce. How much of a role were their productivity and their dedication um, play in this decision, if any? Um, the car is due out in 17. So, um, if you work, if you work your dates back from that date, you're going to have to call the marker within the second quarter of this year. You can't wait any longer. Um, 
I, I said this before, I, I think we owe, we, owe, we owe a lot to the workforce in Toledo. Um, I've been public on this before, I reiterate the point. I, um, I know that they've done exceptional things to make that car what it is today. Yeah, it's going to play a role. Sure it is. But the number is so large. That Unaided, unsupported. There's just no way that it could ever happen. So there has to be something that comes to the table. It's just Is there a possibility of something being on the table with the city or the state at this know. point? Let me, let, me, let me have the meetings. It's a tall order. So, right. uh, Sonari Glinton with uh, NPR. Uh, the, the U.S. economy almost took down Chrysler. Um, it's been five years since the bailout. Um, could you talk about that and then... How much of a worry is the European economy to um, FCA, and how do you mitigate those hazards? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the first question. Oh, I just wonder what what you're thinking five years after the bailout. Um, <laughs> this show. Um, it's almost six years. Eh? June 10th this year will be the sixth year. Um, look, a lot has happened. I think. Um, all the prognostications that people had in place back in '09 about the recovery of the auto industry have proved right. You know, it was an intervention that has a good outcome. I mean, people can spend time and you know, determine how much the bailout ultimately cost taxpayers. The reality is that when you come into the show today and you compare it to what we saw in January of '09 or even January of '10 you are looking at two completely different worlds. Right? You've got an industry which is in a relatively decent shape. I mean, it's the, all of us are making some money making cars. The question is whether we're making enough. Um, but nobody's talking about restructuring of the industry. Nobody's taking, talking about taking capacity down. I think we have seen an incredibly disciplined behavior in the marketplace by all the players, not just the Detroit Three. Um, and I think we have seen the both bailout candidates and the one that wasn't bailed out perform incredibly well out of the city. And so I, if I had to sort of assign it the grade uh, for the way in which we've performed, I, I think we deserve some level of A, whether it's an A minus, an A or an A plus. I'm not sure I'll leave it to you to decide whether we need to qualify the A, but I think we've done well. And I think we have, I'm not talking about Chrysler, at least, we took our obligation that we had with taxpayers pretty seriously. We extinguished that liability back in, in May of 2011, even less than two years after the money was lent. So it, there's been incredibly rapid progress to come out of the doghouse, and I think we are out of the doghouse, whether we're absolutely free of fleas or not is something that um, yeah, I think still think we have some worths. I, you know, the, the, re, the amount of restructuring that went on was pretty severe. We're still playing, we still have some areas of, of, of massive intervention. I, I, um, you know, we need to do a lot more work on powertrains and get this industry moved in the right direction. But I think the fundamentals are solid. And I'm actually incredibly optimistic about what the next few years will bring. We are much better competitors than we've ever been. And that's a great sign. All right, Luann, Dan, then Rod. Okay. Good morning, Luann Hi. Hammond, Driving the Nation. Um, two questions. Which manufacturing plants currently make aluminum vehicles, and even if the city of Toledo bought up all the land around your plant and made another plant, would you not consider making it there? Yeah, you offered a lot. Mm -hmm. If you bought all the land and you built the plant, if you did that, that would make the problem go away, a big chunk of it. You'd have to buy all the land and build the plant. Inside NAFTA, no one. 
outside of NAFTA, there are at least three plants in Europe that are manufacturing all aluminum bodies. Not of the mass production kind that you talked about, but certainly know, have experience in aluminum. All right, Dan? Hi, Mr. Marchioni. Uh, Dan Zarek from WXYZ here in the back. Hi. Hi, sir. Uh, since you've taken over, there's been a careful calibration of control uh, on your company, expanding uh, Chrysler's portfolio, getting things in better financial shape since the inception. What work still needs to be done um, by you and your team going forward? We have the expansion of uh, the Alfa Romeo here in North America. Can you kind of exp uh, share with your, us your thoughts on what your plans are going forward? Uh, we laid out a plan back in May that takes this company from um, where we're just about ready to report, which is about almost 4.7 million cars in 2014 to 7 million cars. That's a huge um, shift in volumes. Um, the target for this year is in excess of 5 million. We have, and, and so across, across all the brands and across all the geographies that SCA is active and we have a variety of growth initiatives which are designed to strengthen all brands, but two in particular are going to require a huge amount of attention, one of which is the really the, the, the execution of the globalization exercise on Jeep, because Jeep needs to become um, certainly the largest brand within FCA, and it needs to become the most global brand within FCA. And so we, we have started manufacturing the smaller segment SUVs for Jeep out of, out of Europe. We will be, and I was just exchanging emails today but with our Latin American friends, but we will be in production with the Renegade for, for Latin American purposes out of our Brazilian plant within the first quarter of this year. And hopefully we'll open the plant officially within April. Um, that car together with the Nest, together, together with um, the Cherokee, which is produced in Toledo in some expanded form, will find its way into China. Um, we need to re rejuvenate the offering of the Patriot and the Compass, which have been sort of historical mainstays of the brand here in the U.S. So there's a huge amount of activity that's going around Jeep, and that is re that's both on product and in terms of geographic expansion of activities to try and get us to this magic number of a million nine. Right? The number, a couple of million Jeeps worldwide is by far a historical record. It would be the largest brand that we that we have within our fold, and certainly it would be the most successful execution of a growth plan that I've ever witnessed. Because when I arrived here, I remember having a conversation with Mike Manley, who was now in the room here, about the fact that we were dreaming of selling half a million Jeeps back in 2009. We sold a million last year. Um, but it's testimony, I, th I think, of the strength of the brand, or the strength of an American brand, or the caliber of Jeep. And that's something that I think we need to fight to preserve, I mean, the Wrangler story and its importance as an anchor point to the brand is something which has not ever been negotiated. It will never, I made the point that it will never be manufactured outside the U.S. and it won't. As I have issues about the Grand Cherokee being manufactured anywhere else or even the upper vehicle which will be coming out before 2018 to extend the range. Um, those are the key objectives. The other one, obviously, which Reed talked about this morning, is the launch of Alfa Romeo. I saw the car, incredibly sexy animal out there, wonderful. You only, we only make 3,000 a year, right? I mean, it's, that's not going to move the needle to get to 7 million. So there's a whole series of product introductions that are being planned for Alfa over the next four years, which will consume both capital and time, but we need to sell about 400,000 cars by the end of 2018. So those, are remain, those remain the key objectives going forward. Having said this, there's a relatively large work order around every other one of the brands, which we don't talk about because the other ones are sexier. But um, they are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in connection with RAM. The, um, 
universalization of Chrysler is really the, as the mass market brand here and the completion of the work that has been started on Dodge to turn it into the sports car end of our offering in the NAFTA market. So all these things are, you know, these are all the pots that are brewing right now. I think we, need, we can't burn any. Oh, huge amount of attention to detail and to execution. The plan is laid out. We're not going to change it. Thank you. Sergio, <coughs> hi. hi. Carol Masser of Bloomberg Radio. Two questions, if I may. Oil and gasoline prices, um, do you see this as very temporary or having kind of any lasting impact on strategy at your firm in terms of uh, development? Secondly, Ferrari and the IPO and building that into a bigger brand. There's been talk of hotels and clubs. I'm just curious what your expectations are for that. Um, and the first issue, I, I, I think the, the relevance of oil, I, I, I think Royal oil prices become very negative for us when you start talking about insane numbers. Like if you start talking about 10 to $15 a gallon oil, we start getting very, very uh, concerned and you'll see incredibly apoplectic reactions by most car makers to a reality like that. Um, I think people have overestimated the impact of cheap oil on the current development of the, of, of the portfolio because what is really driving portfolio development in the U.S. now is compliance with regulatory standards in, in terms of CO2, in terms of CO2 emissions. So as much as I think the public is naturally favoring the larger vehicles because of the, of, of, of the fact that gas is cheap, or relatively cheap. Um, we have an obligation to try and bring technology to allow that portion of the fleet to continue to comply with EPA requirements. It is um, the consequence of all this is that we're going to be, we're gonna, if effectively these oil prices continue at these levels and we continue to favor the larger vehicles in the fleet, we're going to end up pushing technology into these vehicles to make them compliant at a much faster rate than any of us have thought. If that effectively happens, it will shift the economics of, of the vehicles because they be, they'll become more expensive. Do you think that will happen? So, I, you know, I've never been a good forecaster of oil prices, and I, and I would be, I would, shouldn't start now in my age. I've, um, it's possible, um, but I think we're ready, we're ready to comply. The only thing we really need to find out is, you know, I think if you asked all the other car makers in this, in this venue here. I think that I'll tell you they'll be able to play. So whatever happens, we'll play. I, before I start giving you specifics as we start doing clubs and hotels and stuff, I, I think that there's a piece of the, of the luxury brand story that needs to be filled out. I caution uh, people from extrapolating too much from this um, from this luxury goods story into a, what I consider to be a, a very democratic distribution of Ferrari into the marketplace. What has made Ferrari unique, um, apart, apart from its history, which is unrivaled, I mean, it, it, it just in the automotive space, is the fact that it's maintained its emphasis on exclusivity right throughout its life. Um, Certainly since I've been involved with the business since 2004, we have, even at the time of the crisis in 2007 and 2008, we have shown incredible restraint in terms of reducing production volumes to ensure that we will not sell one more car than the market demanded. And so when the U.S. market effectively dried up as a result of the financial crisis, we choked the numbers right back. And we are now obviously at the other end of the spectrum because the markets are coming back and there's additional appetite for that um, price class of vehicles. But um, we need to be very careful that we don't create too much of a democratic view of Ferrari. Ferrari needs to continue to be an aspirational, exclusive brand in everything that it does, whether it ex and it will extend beyond cars, it needs to be faithful to those, to, to those criteria. So a very careful development of the brand that reflects the exclusive nature of its offerings. We'll take the two in the back and then up front. Okay, go ahead, Betty. Mr. Marchioni, Magda Gebrasolasso with CBC News in Windsor. Earlier you said you're trying to work out the economics on whether or not Windsor will make an SUV. Can I ask, a have you... CUV. Sorry? A CUV. Yes. Um, have you restarted talks with the federal and provincial governments after pulling out last year? No. So what will it take 
to for Windsor to make that car, that vehicle? Favorable economics in terms of demand, which is not which the federal and provincial government cannot help um, at all. Ready? Right next to you. Right there. <laughs> Okay. My question was along the same lines. Christy Bazaar from CTV Windsor. The situ has the relationship improved at all? I know you had called the, the treatment by the Canadian government. They, you felt that they were treating the company as a political football leading into the election, but we do now have a liberal majority. Has anything improved? Well, the fact that I, I, I said we had become a political football is true. Um, and I think, I thought, and I continue to think that it was an unfair treatment of Chrysler in the circumstances. I mean, I, I think the Canadians have now resolved sort of their electoral choices, um, and the problem has gone away. But and yet in the interim, we have moved on with the investment. The, the van is being built. Um, I don't think there's anything that could possibly happen now out of the, out of the Canadian government side, whether it be provincial or federal that needs to be done other than to maintain civil relationships between um, an investor and a taxpayer of the caliber of SCA in Canada and the, and the government agencies. I mean, it's just, I don't need anything right now. But the situation has improved. I had a conversation with the Premier of Ontario. I went to see the, the pr Prime Minister a while back. Um, and I think the relationship is, has remained cordial. Brian Traring, Great Television in Toledo. Question about the Cherokee. You mentioned it earlier. How satisfied are you with sales? How important is it to your product line? Is there anything new that you're planning for that product in the future? I can tell you right now that we're, we already have the next phase, the next evolution of the Cherokee done. We're working through the... Um, through the details of the last changes. So the car should be coming out within a period of 24 to 30 months. Um, obviously, the application of the nine speed on that vehicle, nine speed transmission, has been a very painful application and something that, you know, in hindsight, we should have probably applied it to a passenger car as opposed to applying it to a, a sophisticated and complex a vehicle as the Cherokee. But I'm pleased with what we've done. I think it can do more. I think the next phase the next version, the next MCA of the, of the vehicle will, um, will outperform the current one. I think it's a, I think it's a better looking, better performing car than the current Cherokee. But I think you need to wait two and a half years to get it, so buy, the, buy one now. Michael McKee from Bloomberg. I, I want to go back to what you said just a few moments ago about uh, not being any more optimistic than you've ever been and contrast that or put that in context with what you said this morning about the need for consolidation. I, is the industry in good shape now and you're worried about the future? Uh, can you expand on your comments this morning about the need for consolidation and, and in terms of that, who needs to consolidate? Where is the overcapacity that needs to be taken out that you're worried about? I, you know, the interesting thing is that everybody who who brings up this issue thinks that there is an overcapacity issue to be addressed and therefore consolidation is the instrument whereby you eliminate the overhang. The problem is not the 